The mysteries of the rosary. There are four sets or decades of them. The joyful, the luminous, the sorrowful, and the glorious. And each one of them has five mysteries of their own. That's 20 mysteries. There's a lot to be said about these mysteries, and we hope to study them with you by exploring what the Bible has to say about them. But first, why are they called mysteries? There's a good chance you might have puzzled at one time or another why all these themes of the rosary are called mysteries. Having been raised a Protestant, not only did I struggle with the concept of mystery in association with the rosary, I had an even bigger struggle with the whole idea of the rosary. But it was the discovery of what mystery means in the context of Christian theology that taught me to pursue the spirituality that praying the mysteries of the rosary can foster. So I want to outline for you three essential aspects of the Christian understanding of mystery. Let's look at the Christian mystery as it is spoken of in relation to the sacraments, in relation to the gospel of our salvation, and finally, in relation to the full sweep of the church's liturgical year. This will lead us to examine how the mysteries of the rosary help us to enter deeply into these mysteries. The Greek word for mystery, which is mysterion, is very similar to our familiar English word, but the meaning of the Greek mysterion had significantly different connotations to it from what we usually associate with our popular understanding of mystery. Most of us typically think of a mystery as a crime story that keeps us in suspense as a detective or some other sleuth pursues a path laid out from a few often vague and ambiguous clues until a perpetrator is finally unveiled. In the Greek-speaking regions of the ancient Roman Empire, mysteries were almost always associated with religions. As the Roman Empire grew to encompass most of southern Europe, northern Africa, and extended far into Asia, they turned many of the peoples they conquered into slaves. As these many slaves were taken and made to serve in various regions of the empire, the many gods of classical Greece and Rome began to give way to new and exotic cults. Many of these had secret rituals that purported to lead adherents ever closer to a perceived goal of religious perfection, which did not necessarily mean moral perfection. These secret rites and practices, hidden as they were from public notice, led these cults to be called mystery religions. The Greek mysterion is closely related to the English words secret and hidden. Even early Christianity bore some resemblance to mystery religions because both Jesus and St. Paul spoke of the mystery at the heart of their mission. As Christianity spread its way through the Roman Empire, it also kept many of its rites secret, hidden from public view. For a long time, the celebration of Eucharist was kept as secret as possible because eating the body and blood of Christ could be so easily misinterpreted as cannibalism, which could have provoked arrest and persecution. Converts to Christianity often only learned about the Eucharist after they were baptized. The post-baptismal period of the modern Catholic rite of Christian initiation of adults, known as mystagogia, was originally intended to prepare the newly baptized and confirmed for participation in Holy Eucharist. Indeed, all our sacraments were originally called mysteries. To this day, Catholics who belong to Eastern Rite churches, as well as Orthodox Christians, refer to what Roman Catholics call sacraments as mysteries. While we no longer try to keep our sacraments secret from the world, our seven sacraments are still very much mysteries. They are mysteries for what is hidden within them. There were two Latin words used to translate the Greek mysterion. One, the very similar term mysterium, and the other was sacramentum. The Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us that sacramentum was employed in a way to emphasize the visible earthly sign of the hidden reality of salvation, while mysterium emphasized the reality hidden within. So our sacraments are visible physical realities that bring to us what is hidden within them namely the mystery of our salvation. 
The Catechism goes on to state that the mystery of our salvation is Christ himself. This brings us to Jesus' own use of the word mystery in his preaching and subsequently to Paul's use of the term mystery in his letters. There is only one occurrence where Jesus uses the word mysterion. It's in Mark chapter 4, verse 11. There he responds to his disciples who have asked him why he speaks to the crowds in parables. He tells them, the mystery of the kingdom of God has been granted to you, but to those outside, everything comes in parables. In other words, Jesus is reminding his disciples that he has spoken plainly to them about the kingdom of God, a kingdom that is mysteriously present in Jesus' ministry, and his disciples have become part of his ministry. But the crowds are still outside the kingdom of God, which Jesus nevertheless invites them to enter by arousing their curiosity through his use of parables. The parables tell of the kingdom of God, but only those truly interested in the kingdom of God will endeavor to pry open the meaning of the parables. Everything comes in parables to the crowds so that they may look and see but not perceive and hear and listen but not understand, in order that they may not be converted and be forgiven. This is probably Jesus' way of saying that those who resist Jesus' teaching will blame their ignorance of the kingdom on its being a secret hidden inside a parable. Only those who truly want to know about the kingdom will ponder the meaning of the parables. Jesus, of course, would have actually addressed his disciples and the crowds in Aramaic rather than Greek. But the Aramaic word for mystery has much the same meaning and it is used several times in the book of Daniel. Paul makes frequent use of mysterion. It appears twice in Romans, twice in 1 Corinthians, and multiple times in Ephesians and Colossians. In most cases, the mystery Paul speaks of is the mystery of God's plan of salvation, a plan that remained a mystery to God's people until it was revealed in Jesus' death and resurrection, which brought forgiveness of sins and allowed Gentiles to become members of God's holy people. Paul makes it very clear that the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation is made known through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians, Paul, in prison, is recorded as asking for prayers that he may proclaim the mystery of the gospel even while in chains. With all prayer and supplication, pray at every opportunity in the Spirit. To that end, be watchful with all perseverance and supplication for all the holy ones and also for me, that speech may be given me to open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, so that I may have the courage to speak as I must. Paul refers to the gospel he preaches as a mystery because it is God's plan of salvation, a hidden plan, a secret known only to God and just hinted at in the messages of the prophets God sent to ancient Israel. Paul's gospel informs all who will listen that God has brought about the salvation of the world through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is God's own Son. The church regards the sacraments as mysteries because they employ the ordinary things of creation to bring us into direct contact with God's saving activity in Jesus Christ. Through the sacraments, God touches us by forgiving us, cleansing us, healing us, joining us to Christ, and calling us to serve his people. So this is the link between the mysteries that are our sacraments and the mystery of God's plan of salvation revealed in Jesus Christ. The sacraments are doors through which the kingdom of God enters our daily lives, helping us to be signs of God's kingdom, light in the midst of darkness, and peace where there is chaos. Through the preaching or proclamation of the gospel, we hear the good news of our salvation in Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit are brought to believe and rejoice in it. Through the power of the sacraments, we become not just hearers of the good news, not just believers in the good news, but actual participants in the life of Christ, 
what the Gospel of John refers to as eternal life. The sacraments, then, are mysteries that bring us into active participation in the divine life revealed in the mystery of God's plan of salvation. But wait, there is even more mystery to explore. Over many, many years, the Catholic Church has developed a detailed pattern of worship. This pattern was developed to further assist us, year in and year out, in hearing and participating in the mystery of the gospel along with our celebration of the sacraments, especially the sacrament of the Eucharist. This detailed pattern of worship is known as the liturgical year. The most recent changes to the liturgical year came after Vatican II, when the liturgical year was given three distinct cycles. Now, each liturgical year gets associated with one of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew one year, Mark the next, followed by a year centered on Luke. The Gospel of John feeds into each of these years, but especially in Matthew's year during the season of Lent. With this three-year cycle, we continue to have the same liturgical seasons repeated year after year, but we now do so blessed by the perspective of three different Gospels, each in their own special year. We now have three windows through which we contemplate the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and actually enter in by means of the Eucharist. The more cognizant we are of each liturgical season, the more caught up we become in the mystery of our salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. The liturgical year then becomes the rich, fertile soil in which a genuinely Christian spirituality can grow. But what about the mysteries of the rosary? What is their relationship to the sacraments and to the gospel of Jesus Christ? For centuries, the rosary has been the mainstay of many Catholics' prayer lives. It would be safe to say that it was a more central feature of many Catholics' prayer lives than even the Mass. This is because before the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, multitudes of the faithful preferred to pray the rosary rather than attempt to enter what was for them a barrage of undecipherable Latin flowing from the back-turned priest celebrant. After Vatican II, when the faithful were called to once again become necessary participants in the Eucharistic liturgy, the rosary was discovered to be a distraction during Mass and actually ceased to be an essential practice of a new generation of Catholics. Could it really be that the laity's greater participation in the Eucharist led to a widespread desertion of the rosary? I would rather believe that the renewal of the Eucharistic liturgy has given us a special opportunity to rediscover the spiritual treasure we have in the rosary. I can believe that is true because of something wonderful that was in instituted by Pope St. John Paul II in October of 2002. In an apostolic letter, the Holy Father asked that a new set of mysteries, called by him the mysteries of light, or the luminous mysteries, be added to the prayers of the rosary. Until 2002, there were only three sets of mysteries traditionally associated with the rosary, the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious mysteries. It had long been customary to pray a specific set of mysteries on specific days. The joyful mysteries were usually prayed on Mondays and Thursdays, as well as on Sundays during Advent. The sorrowful mysteries were usually prayed on Tuesdays and Fridays, and again on Sundays during Lent. The glorious mysteries were usually prayed on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and on Sundays outside of Lent. After the Pope's apostolic letter concerning the rosary, the luminous mysteries were assigned to Thursdays. The addition of these mysteries was anything but capricious. They were intended to more fully align the rosary with the fullness of the mystery of Christ revealed in the gospel and celebrated in worship in the course set out by the liturgical calendar. Not only did Pope St. John Paul II give us new mysteries, he urged us to adopt a way of praying the rosary that had been all too neglected in the traditional manner of praying the mysteries. He asked us to pray all the mysteries with prayerful meditation on the scriptures. 
It either revealed or shed special light on the mysteries of the rosary. The rosary was now to be part of the renewal of sacred scripture in the life of all the faithful. What the luminous mysteries contributed to the rosary were five essential aspects of Jesus' ministry and teaching from the time of his baptism by John through his Last Supper with his disciples. But what the inclusion of the luminous mysteries did for the rosary was to transform it into a mirror in miniature of the liturgical year. To sum up what I said previously, the mystery hidden within the liturgical year is the opportunity for us to participate in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. We begin the liturgical year in Advent when we await the return of Christ as well as placing ourselves in the situation of those who first awaited the Savior as well as all of those who presently yearn for redemption and long for a sense of ultimate purpose. With Christmas, we are called to be astounded by God's decision to be one with us, to be Emmanuel, to be subject to the poverty and fragility of being human in a largely hostile world. The joyful mysteries of the rosary capture the essence of the liturgical seasons of Advent and Christmas. As Christmas climaxes with the epiphany and baptism of the Lord, we discover that we are to pay acute attention to what Jesus both says and does. For the Father proclaims of him, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Ordinary time is the green season, the season where Sundays are given ordinal numbers between Christmas and Lent, and which resume again following Easter and Pentecost continuing until a new liturgical year begins at the next Advent. This green season is where we are to grow in grace by attending to Christ's teaching and by witnessing his miraculous presence among the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The luminous mysteries, whenever we pray them, also water the seeds of spiritual growth planted in us through the season of ordinary time. During Lent, we confront ourselves with the seriousness of being called to be a disciple of the one who died for us and who calls us to repentance of our sins so that we can share more fully in his risen life. Then, in the deepest mystery of the Holy Triduum, we rediscover why our spiritual life is centered on the Eucharist, which he gave to us as a living remembrance of his death on a cross only to rise as the light of the world in the midst of any darkness we experience. The sorrowful mysteries of the rosary bring us into prayerful contemplation of Jesus' last days in much the same way as we are called to experience during Lent. Throughout the Easter season, we are called to rejoice in Christ's resurrection, knowing that in doing so, we are given a foretaste of our own resurrection. In shouting, He is risen, He is risen indeed, we become the most joyful of people, for in Him we too have received the gift of eternal life. As Christ's risen life becomes hidden in God at the ascension, a new mystery becomes revealed at Pentecost. With Jesus' ascension, humanity has made its home in God, and at Pentecost, God has found a home in our humanity. The glorious mysteries also celebrate the mysteries of Easter through Pentecost and culminate with the realization that the church's share in the resurrection has already begun in the person of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Finally, let's recap. The gospel of Christ reveals the mystery of our life in God. The liturgical year in its three distinct yet harmonious cycles helps us enter that mystery step by precious step. Now the rosary, with the addition of the luminous mysteries, calls us into prayerful scriptural contemplation of the fullness of the gospel as it is experienced through the many facets of the liturgical year. I hope as you encounter many of the scriptures associated with the mysteries of the rosary, you will take time to pray the rosary as well and thereby discover more profoundly the gospel of the Lord and the riches of our liturgical year.